Now the floor to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Manuele Dabala, who will speak about the development of thermomechanical processes as an alternative to grain refiners in 10 uh, car uh, gold alloys. He's an ordinary professor at the Department of Engineering at Padua University, and he works on the surface treatment on metals. Corrosion, uh, powder metallurgy and production of uh, uh, metallic nano powder. More than 100 uh, publications, a member of the Italian Society uh, of Metallurgy and the European Society. He is in charge of uh, many projects uh, to produce uh, nano particles and surface treatment of metals. The use of grain refiners such as iridium and 18 uh, carat gold is common practice. These elements have an impact on the cost of raw materials used. The aim of the presentation is to demonstrate that without refiners in an alloy, you can uh, obtain similar results uh, when uh, refiners are used, improving thermomechanical processes. You have the floor. Um, uh, we presented my work uh, on the development of thermomechanical processes as an alloy alternative to the grain refiners in 18 carats alloy. Mm because the aim of this study was uh, to control the grain size of uh, 18 carats of gold alloy during the thermomechanical processes of the production of a hollow chain avoiding the use of grain refiners. Usually in the uh, production of uh, many uh, processes and, and the production of many mm, <coughs> Uh, objects in uh, jewelry, it is used uh, grain refiners because they, during the solidification, promotes the uh, nucleation of uh, uh, the grains. And during the recrystallization, they interact with the grain boundary of uh, the refiner uh, and avoid the diffusion of the atoms between the grain, uh, the grain boundaries in order to reduce the growth of the uh, grains during the uh, process of recrystallization, during the annealing, essentially. So, the, grain, the use of grain refiners is very popular because it is possible to obtain in as cast condition the uh, very small grain size. And it also it is um, very popular to use the grain refiners in order to control the grain growth during the annealing. As a constraint, is not carefully use uh, a lot of uh, grain refiners because they tends to um, form hard precipitates that can control the grain uh, growth during that needed, but they can induce uh, brittleness in the uh, alloys. <coughs> and moreover, the precipitation of uh, hard precipitates uh, hard particles can uh, reduce the surface quality of the um, of the objects, and moreover, uh, the use of grain refiners is expensive because uh, uh, platinum, uh, iridium, ruthenium, and other uh, like, for example, uh, uh, other um, grain refiners are very expensive. Or uh, in the case of cobalt, they can introduce magnetism in the alloy. So, um, why it is necessary to use grain refiners? Because uh, during the solidification, uh, there are two steps. The first step is the formation of nuclei, that is close, uh, called the nucleation, and the other step is the growth of this nuclei to form all the um, solid uh, material. Uh, in order to obtain the nucleation, it is necessary two terms in, in terms of energy. One negative, that is the terms of free energy of volumetric, that is the passage from liquids 
two solids. And the other is the uh, positive uh, terms of energy, that is the creation of an interface between solid and liquid. As you can see in the picture that uh, there are uh, terms uh, positive, that is the red curve, that is the <coughs> solidification, uh, the, the energy necessary for the uh, creation of interface, and the blue curves, that is the energy necessary for the solidification, the free energy negative terms to create the solid. If you sum these two uh, to curves, to terms of energy, in uh, mm, related with the radius of the nuclei, it is possible to find a critical radius, R stars, where the uh, nuclei are stable if the radius of these nuclei are larger than the value of R stars. If you have a nuclei uh, with a radius lower than R stars, the uh, nuclei are not stable and tend to redissolve. So, how is this critical size and essentially what determines its size? The size of this critical uh, radius, it depends on the surface energy, it depends on the melting point of the material, but essentially depends on the undercooling of the uh, liquid. If the undercooling is higher, the radius becomes lower. So, if you have a lower radius, you have higher nucleation. But how is the range of this undercooling? And you can see in the right side of the uh, picture that uh, it is necessary usually in a homogeneous nucleation, to have a very large undercooling to obtain a very high number of nuclei. If you have a very small undercooling, the nucleation is very poor and you have very poor, uh, very low number of nuclei and a very large size of the grains. For this reason, it is better to introduce a surface that increase the wettability of the alloy and reduce the uh, undercooling and promotes the nucleation. The interfacial energy will be reduced and the uh, presence of surfaces introduce a larger nucleation. So what is the, this kind of surface? One is the surface of the mold, the other is the inoculants and essentially iridium and ruthenium acts as wedded surface during the solidification to facilitate the nucleation. Moreover, iridium and ruthenium reduces the interfacial energy for the nucleation of an, a gold alloy or other kind of precious alloys. The other term is the recrystallization. When we deform a material, and uh, gold alloy, platinum alloy, what, which kind of alloy. During the plastic deformation, the alloys reduce the grain size. But the reduction of grain size is uh, with an uh, uh, increasing of the energy, of the internal energy of the alloys. Because during the deformation, part of the energy is absorbed of the alloys to reduce the grain size. But uh, when the temperature of the alloys is raised, there is a behavior that is called recrystallization that produces the nucleation and the growth of strain-free grains. These strain-free grains reduce the uh, tensile strength, reduce the hardness, not always, but essentially increases the ductility of the alloys. This is the process that occurs during the annealing. Okay? But what's happened? If the material, when it is recrystallized, is further annealed and the time at high temperature becomes larger, uh, there is the formation of very large grains that grows from the strain-free uh, grains. 
This because, because the grain boundary energy is reduced to the reduces uh, to the decrease in the grain boundary area. So it is necessary to increase the size of the uh, of the material uh, of the grains of the material. So the grain growth involves the movement of grain boundaries and. Uh, it is important to reduce this grain growth in order to maintain high mechanical properties of the alloy, in order to avoid brittleness of the alloy. Okay? So, how is possible to reduce this grain growth? It is possible to reduce the movement of these grain boundaries. There is two possibilities. Or you have a second phase particles, and second phase particles decreases because it's a block for the grain movement, of the grain boundary movement. Or it is possible to uh, reduce the grain growth by reducing the diffusion, because these processes are processes governed by diffusion. It is impossible to reduce the grain growth by the diffusion of the uh, grain boundaries uh, of the atoms between the grain boundaries, from the boundaries of, at of uh, adjacent grains. So, in order to... Uh, this is very important, especially when uh, we speak about the production of gold alloy chains, or hollow chains. Because gold hollow chains uh, and uh, uh, materials necessary for the production of uh, chains uh, hollow uh, needs to have a very high mechanical properties and uh, they uh, need to uh, avoid brittleness of the material. So usually the process the pro to produce gold hollow chains is a first step of casting, a second step of rolling in order to obtain a ribbon and uh, and further annealing, further uh, rolling, and so on. And at the end, it is necessary to weld the uh, ribbon with uh, another ribbon uh, of uh, iron, and usually to um, bend the material in order to obtain the, uh, the chain uh, that uh, maintains a small fenditure between the the border of the of the ribbons in order to uh, remove uh, the the iron uh, by uh, acid etching. Uh, so uh, in this uh, oil production, it is very important to uh, control the steps of annealing and the steps of rolling. Because if you control the steps of rolling and the steps of annealing, it is, you can obtain a very high uh, quality of the surface and a very high uh, mechanical properties of the alloy. So, uh, in our uh, work, we use uh, uh, as a reference alloy an uh, 18 carat alloy, which contain, as you can see, 0.05% of iridium. Uh, we compare this alloy with a similar alloy, a foreign alloy, uh, where the iridium is uh, completely disappeared. And uh, another, uh, and uh, starting from these two points, we uh, study a lot of alloys, but the best results that we obtain is with the alloy called alloy 2, where you can see that the composition is close to the alloys refined, but we change the composition in order to avoid the diffusion of the uh, elements between the gain boundaries in order to reduce the growth of the uh, recrystallized nuclei, uh, recrystallized grain. You can see in the picture uh, the um, alloy obtained in a horizontal furnace and a vertical furnace, but you can see the difference between a, a refined alloy that contains the grain refiner uh, iridium and the grain size of the foreign alloy, the alloy 2. You can see that the size of the uh, grains after casting are completely different in the grain refined alloy. Uh, the size of the grains is very small. In the case of a foreign alloy and alloy 2, the grain size is very, very large. But this is due because we don't have any kind of control on the nucleation. But 
Uh, we studied the process, the thermomechanical process, with the aim of this uh, investigation. And uh, you can see that uh, the uh, reduction, uh, the section reduction obtained during rolling is more or less between 35% and 65%, with a medium of 50%. And the annealing was made uh, at the beginning with, um, in a step at 660 degrees for 45 minutes uh, each uh, uh, annealing steps. At the end, uh, the spot welding where it is uh, introduced, uh, the, the iron ribbon, uh, the iron foil on the gold foil is obtained by a welding process, a spot welding process with a current of 20,000 uh, 20, per. And uh, after the uh, welding, the, there is an annealing at 930 degree uh, for two minutes, only to uh, reduce the, uh, is a stress relieving uh, annealing. This is the result uh, obtained after rolling and annealing in the reference alloy. You can see that the grain size is maintained more or less uh, similar. Uh, you don't have any uh, growth of the grain size during the annealing due to the effect of the grain refiners that acts as uh, inhibitors of the diffusion of the uh, materials between the grain boundaries. Uh, moreover, you can see that after welding process and after the final annealing, the grain size is very, very low and the mechanical properties in the, with this kind of microstructure is very nice, is very high. There is a small uh, variation in the uh, size of the, uh, or better, it is uh, the size distribution of the grain size uh, is larger after the final annealing than in the previous process. This is because the temperature is very high and so uh, it is possible to have an, uh, an higher grain growth when you use an high uh, temperature of um, annealing. Uh, this is the uh, the Vickers micro harness obtained uh, after the different steps. You can see that at the end, after the welding process and the final annealing, the harness obtained is not, uh, very small, very, yes, very low, and uh, it is possible to obtain an alloy that is very tough. It's not hard, but it's tough. This is the results obtained with the 4N alloy. After the first rolling, the grains remains very large only, uh, but you can see that there are a lot of uh, uh, lines inside the grains that is uh, uh, an exhibition of the deformation obtained by the grains. And after the first annealing, you can see that the grains becomes lower, but rolling and annealing uh, produce a reduction of the uh, of the grain size. So this because the um, thermomechanical proper, uh, process was um, relatively good control. But I want to show you, um, no better, okay. This is the results obtained with the alloy two. Uh, after the first rolling, the uh, results is more or less the same of uh, 4N. But uh, as you can see, after the second annealing, you can see here that there is, after the first annealing, the uh, distribution of the grain size is very large. You can see large grains and small grains uh, the, in, the, in the microstructure. And, and also this is maintained, but uh, in a smaller range, in lower range, after the second annealing. Instead, you can see that uh, in the alloy two, yeah, after the first annealing, we have also a large uh, distribution of the grain size, but this is not maintained after the second annealing and also after the third. Why? Because the change in composition reduce the, uh, distribu the diffusion of the elements between the grain boundaries. So, uh, thanks to the control of the temperature, the time and the 
composition, it is possible to obtain, to obtain after the mechanical process, uh, process uh, good uh, results in terms of um, homogeneity of the grain size. And in fact, you can see that, for example, the uh, grain size after the second annealing and after the final annealing for the alloy refined and for the alloy 2, that is the best, uh, uh, they are very, very close. Instead, the grain size uh, of the 4N alloy without any control in the, uh, with a reference uh, uh, in composition, the grain size is more inhomogeneous and uh, you have a lot of uh, large grains and small grains. Uh, the hardness uh, also is not uh, so different for all the alloys after the process. This is because usually uh, the, in this kind of alloy the terms of hardness is not so important. It is better to terms uh, to, to refer the alloy in not in terms of hardness but in terms of toughness because when you have the, the hardness as you can see it's more or less the same but the microstructure is completely different and so the hardness is not a parameter to consider in this in this kind of production it is better to consider the toughness the the brittle uh, the um, the resistance of the alloy to the deformation Okay. That is obtained by the small grain size. Smaller is the grain size, smaller is a higher is the mechanical properties of the alloy, but not the hardness. The hardness doesn't change. Uh, the colors of the alloys is more or less the same, uh, usually with a colorimetric uh, system based on syllab uh, um, uh, syllab. Uh, system, the, when the difference is more uh, lower than three, the colors is not appreciated by the human uh, eyes. So uh, the alloy refined and the alloy 2 have a, a color that is more or less the same. Uh, we study also the corrosion resistance because we change the composition, so we wanted to see if the corrosion resistance in artificial perspiration is the same, and in fact the results is more or less uh, equivalent. Uh, okay, oops. After that we want, uh, we try to uh, investigate how to uh, improve the uh, quality of the microstructure, reducing the uh, inhomogeneity, inhomogeneity of, the, uh, of the grain size. In uh, alloy 4N, it is possible to see that uh, after 15 minutes, uh, the recrystallization is not completely obtained, but after 20 minutes, all the recrystallization is obtained, but the grain growth starts. In fact, after 20 minutes, you can see that there is the uh, grains with uh, large size and grains with uh, small size. So the uh, recrystallization uh, is obtained more or less in 20 minutes, but the first grains that recrystallize starts to become uh, larger because they grow, because there are any control, there are no any control. Uh, of the flows of the, met, uh, of the elements between the grain boundaries. Instead, and so you can see that the hardness doesn't change. You can see that the hardness, if you change the temperature and you change the size distribution, the hardness doesn't change. But the grain size increases uh, with a very high, uh, in a very high, uh, mm, mm, with the temperature, with the, with the time. Instead, if you uh, consider the annealing of the alloy 2, you can see that the uh, microstructure is completely recrystallized after 15 minutes, but, and after 20 minutes, the homogeneity of the grain size is more or less uh, acceptable and it is maintained uh, till 40 minutes of annealing. After 40 minutes of annealing, you have that uh, the grain size starts to growth, and uh, you have the, uh, a new, 
uh, are not a homogenization of the grain size. Uh, also, this is the uh, evolution of the average grain size with the uh, temperature, uh, with the time of uh, annealing, and you can see that the hardness doesn't change uh, with the time, but as you can see, after five minutes, you have that uh, part of the grains are not really crystallized. In fact, in the picture, you can see that these large grains is a grain deformed. The small grains at the boundary of this large grain is, uh, are grains that are strain-free, that starts to nucleate and grow. So, we, in this picture you can compare the uh, uh, behavior of the annealing time in, um, in relationship with the uh, average grain size. You can see that controlling the composition uh, you can uh, obtain a better uh, <clears throat> quality of the alloy because the grain size of the alloy number two is smaller with the same temperature, with the same time of the uh, <clears throat> annealing uh, with the, uh, than the 4N alloy. And it is, uh, if you maintain the uh, annealing time in, in less than 20, in more or less 20, 25 minutes, the size of the grain size is not so uh, high, uh, higher than the uh, refined alloy. Uh, this is the Burke thermal analysis and you can see that there is a very linear correlation between the grain size and the uh, logarithm of the time of the annealing. This is a parameter to consider and to uh, um, realize a correct annealing process. So, in conclusion, it was fast, so we recovered some time. <laughs> uh, uh, the iridium uh, in uh, um, 18 carat alloys increase the uh, increase the price of the alloy. So, if we uh, remove uh, the the content. Uh, uh, if we remove the um, refiners, we have an increase in the crystal size after casting because we don't have any control about nucleation. So, in this case, uh, the grain refiners are really necessary for process of casting. But in the case of process of deformation. We, can, we have demonstrated that maybe they are not necessary. In the case of casting, it, they are surely necessary because if you don't have a grain refiner, the grain size after casting are not acceptable. Okay, it's not acceptable. But in the case of the formation of the alloys, this could be avoided. And in fact, uh, <coughs> uh, in the first annealing, the not refined alloys show a strong reduction in the crystalline dimension in the grain size, but uh, they uh, maintain some uh, inhomogeneity. However, uh, after the uh, second uh, rolling and after the third rolling and after the further annealing, the uh, process and uh, the grain size can be maintained um, at level acceptable for the production and it is possible to obtain uh, an alloy that can be used in the production of hollow chains uh, without the use of grain refiners. That is all. Thank you very much for the attention. <laughs>